you can everyone can see my screen this is the first slide yes okay okay thank you so now machine learning uh, this talk is meant for like beginners or uh, maybe you have been a data scientist for some time uh, but you have been focused only on one particular uh, you know subdomain of data science it is impossible for any single researcher to follow everything that's going on in the field so while i was uh, preparing for this talk uh, i found that uh, in some research paper they have published they have done a study and i found that every month thousands of papers are being published in the field of ai and ml right when i say thousands it's like 2 or 2000 3000 4000 so it is in that order so it is impossible for any single person to uh, you know follow everything that is going on and if you look at the landscape of data science this is how it is uh, you have uh, supervised learning you have unsupervised learning you have reinforcement learning and then you can further subdivide these things classification regression clustering dimensionality re uh, reduction and within this there could be multiple techniques and so forth so this is a broad uh, you know uh, classification of the different uh, domains and in each of this there could be multiple applications like reinforcement uh, learning could be used in gaming gaming applications or in self driving cars or in certain learning tasks so for each of these techniques or approaches there are multiple algorithms multiple areas of applications and in each of these areas so many research advancements are happening on a regular basis so from all these thousands of papers how do we select five papers for today so the first uh, uh, method is like go and look at lists which are already available online if you go online on github and other sources you will find people have already curated a lot of top AI and ML papers. So many of these are uh, like uh, on GitHub. So the first three are on GitHub. Then this is a very good link, number four, where these are the papers which have won awards at many of the conferences. Conferences specific to AI and ML. AI, ML, computer vision, NLP, and so on. So this is a good resource and likewise others have also published, uh, you know, uh, uh, curated lists on certain things. And today, uh, you know, the, the talk of town is what chat GPT, chat GPT is everywhere. So this link number six, they have curated all the recent papers which are closely associated with chat GPT. So those of you who are more keen on chat GPT, you can visit this link. So this was the first uh, you know, thing I looked at. What are the kind of things people are recommending? Then the next thing I did was I applied certain criteria to select these five papers. So they should be recent papers published in the last 10 years. And they should have significantly advanced the state of the art. So sometimes you will find that a lot of incremental improvements are happening in that field. Let's say computer vision or NLP. Suddenly a paper comes out which changes the game quite drastically. Either it could be improving the accuracy of the algorithm significantly or it could be carving out a new approach altogether to solve the problem. So either way, this is one of the criteria used. Then there are papers which could have, which could be an important paper, but it has not made the transition from research to industry. Right. And sometimes it happens, you know, the paper is really good, but it has not been noticed by the, by others. Or another paper which was published just after that, that got more attention. So that is also an important factor. And finally, visible from the sidelines. So what does it mean uh, when I say visible from the sidelines? What I mean by that is that suppose you are a researcher in the field, that is you are a data scientist working uh, day in and day out in that field. There will naturally be a lot of papers which come to your interest, which come to your attention. So when you look at it that way, it becomes difficult to select because all, all those papers may be influential. But then when I picked 
these five papers, I looked at uh, these five papers from the perspective of a lay person who is outside the data science field, but he or she has heard of this. For example, chat GPT. Everyone has heard of chat GPT. Even if you are not a data scientist, you would have heard of it. So this is one of the criteria I have used because this is an indicator, kind of an indicator that says that it has made the transition from research to industry and within the industry, it has had a significant impact. That is why it has been covered by mainstream media and a lot of people who are even not data scientists, they have started to take notice of it or at least they have become aware of it. So these are the criteria I used. Uh, of course, uh, even with these criteria, there can be a little bit of subjectivity. So I don't claim that the five papers I have selected are the only uh, five great papers. There could be others. And at the end of this presentation, I'll sh share with you some other uh, papers which are just as important. So with that introduction, let's begin. So the first paper is what was published in 2012. So this is the title and abstract of the paper, and it is called ImageNet Classification with Deep Convolution and Neural Networks. And it was published uh, by uh, three researchers, and the first researcher has a first name, Alex. And since then, this paper has been popularly called as the AlexNet paper. So when we talk about AlexNet paper, this is the paper they are referring to. It was published in 2012. So uh, from the title itself, you can make out it is in the computer vision domain and it is a classification problem. So in the first slide we saw, you know, classification is one of the supervised learning problems. The other thing we note from the title, it's, it's a neural network approach. So what is so great about this? So if truth be told, data science or AI ML has been around for a few decades. Uh, from the 1960s itself, there has been interest in AI. But for various reasons, uh, the field did not take off until more recently. So after 2000, there was again a lot of interest, particularly in the area of neural networks. So when people were looking at neural networks, one of the things that fascinated researchers is image classification. So given a set of images, can you classify correctly what that image represents? So one of the things which people started doing, like this data set called MNIST, was released in 1994. So here what people started doing was, uh, uh, they re the uh, task here is given a set of 10 digits, can you, uh, can the algorithm recognize? Suppose the algorithm is shown this particular digit. Can it recognize and tell correctly that this is a three? And likewise, this one is blurry or uh, very uh, thick strokes, but can it recognize the shape and tell that this is an eight? So this is how people started uh, applying neural networks to the image classification problem. And uh, this data set has about 60,000 training data, 10,000 test data. And this field advanced uh, through the 1990s, and by 2002, they had achieved almost human performance. So the error rate was 0.5% with SVMs. It's a technique uh, in uh, machine learning, uh, support vector missions. So with that kind of a technique, they achieved uh, you know 0.5%. But around the same time, people were also uh, starting to experiment with neural networks. And by 2010, people had uh, developed neural networks which would achieve the similar performance or even better performance, like 0.4% uh, with neural networks on the MNIST data. So this was the state of the art in 2010. But applying those neural networks to real uh, photorealistic images, such as images of a cat or a dog, that was still a challenge. People were not able to do it. So that is where this paper becomes significant, the paper we are talking about, because they took the neural network approach, which was working for simple images like this, you know, character recognition. They made certain changes with the neural network architecture, and then they were able to apply it on images, and they got fantastic performance. So that is why this paper has become very influential. Uh, so this paper actually took part in a competition called the ImageNet Challenge. 
So this challenge ran from 2010 right up to 2017. And uh, this paper itself was submitted, submitted to this challenge in 2012. Right, it was published in 2012. It might have been submitted the same year or the following year. And it achieved a new state of the art. So you can see here, you know, it classifies. So this is a mite. This image on the top left represents a mite and it classifies this correctly as a mite. This it is even better. It's a container ship and here it is very strongly classifying it as a container ship. It clearly identifies it is none of the other possibilities like it's not an amphibian. It's not a fire boat or a drilling pack platform. And it's uh, pretty much confident that this is a container ship. And similarly, motor, scooter, leopard and so on. This is an interesting example you can see here. This image has two uh, areas of focus, you can say. In the background, there is a dog. It's a Dalmatian uh, breed. Then in the foreground, there is a bunch of cherries. Cherries uh, uh, or grapes. Uh, actually, it's a bunch of cherries. But the model, in this case, the model gets it wrong. It classifies this image as a Dalmatian. Actually, if you focus on the background, it is Dalmatian. But the way ImageNet is classified by humans, they focus on the foreground. And this was classified as a cherry. So this is one example where, you know, the model can get things wrong. And similarly here, you know, this is a mushroom, but then mushroom is comes second in the classification. It st more strongly thinks it to be belonging to a different category. So this is what ImageNet challenge and, uh, you know, there were other things as part of this challenge, but the main thing was the image classification. And if you look at the state of the art of this paper, see before this in 2011, the top five error uh, error rate was 26%. That means 26% of the test set, the, uh, the algorithm got it wrong. So AlexNet paper changed that state of the art. It brought it down to 16%. And this in turn inspired a lot of other uh, approaches which are built on top of. Built on my professional profession, don't be ridiculous. What are you talking about? Don't be ridiculous. Is it uh, guys, open? I request you to mute your mics. When you have a question, you can uh, unmute your mics. Resource is dirty face to me. You're bloody criminal and justice system. Yes, hold on. Hey, Baba, first you need a corpus. Don't go through investment plans again and again. Skinless beach. Oh, skinless beach is now one of the easy screen of you. Bastard. Huh? Fix it is going God's own country. If another man has got a problem, you should. Uh, Mr. Radha Krishna, I request you to mute your microphone. During Q and A, I'll give you a chance to ask questions. So this was the state of the art and uh, you can see human performance is around uh, 5%. And uh, this human performance itself was surpassed by ResNet, which is again, all these networks are inspired by AlexNet. So AlexNet was a game changer. Now we were able to apply the neural network approach for image classification of photorealistic images. Before it was possible only to do it for simple data sets like MNIST. But now we are able to do it on real images. And I won't go into the details, but you can see here, this is the overall network architecture. There are many layers called convolutional layers. Then there are fully connected layers. Then there is at the end of it, there is a thousand way softmax layer. The reason it is thousand way is because there are thousand different classes. So some some are dogs, mushrooms, uh, um, lifeboats, and so on. So the challenge asked the algorithm to identify the object, which could be one of these thousand classes. So that is why the output is a thousand ways of max. And then uh, uh, overlapping max pooling. This is another innovation which this paper introduced. Right now, this is this kind of architecture has become so commoditized that if you want to use one of these architectures, it is as simple as plug and play. So this is an example from MATLAB where you can just take all these, uh, any of these algorithms which are readily available in MATLAB, just plug it into your uh, workflow. 
and it will work. Right? So these architectures have become so common that many software packages uh, like MATLAB or even in PyTorch or TensorFlow, these architectures are readily available. So that is what uh, you know uh, this paper enabled. So what are the main contributions? Main contribution was you can build uh, by building a neural network which is both wide and deep. So what is a deep neural network? Deep means you have many layers. So as you can see in this paper, they have used as many as eight layers. So that is the first insight. And within each layer, you can use many neurons. So this gives a model very high expressive power. And one of the other things which this paper pointed out, even if they remove one layer, right, one layer in between, which has only 1% of the parameters, but even by removing one layer, they drastically reduce the performance or the accuracy of the overall architecture. So every layer becomes important. So that is why this depth of the model is important. Naturally, when you have a wide and deep model, you have more parameters in your neural network. So to train that, you need a much larger data set. So increasing the model size is not the solution on its own. You also need a larger training data set. Then you, this ImageNet and AlexNet led to what we today call as a pre-trained model. So whenever you have some sort of an image related task, you don't have to train the neural network from scratch. You can initialize the weights and parameters of the network based on training on the ImageNet. So that becomes a pre-trained model. Now if you want to train, uh, use the network for a specific application, you don't have to start training from scratch. And as a result, your training data set need not be very large because already you have leveraged a large data set of ImageNet. So that is another you know, insight that was obtained from this paper. And as I mentioned, this in inspired many other similar models. OK, so this is the first paper. Now let's come to the second paper. Second paper was published in 2015. So the title of the paper is uh, you only look once unified real time object detection and more commonly you only look once is more commonly known as YOLO. So YOLO is a new approach to real time object detection detec uh, detection and it came out in 2015. So uh, many of you would have seen these images. Uh, like in my case, uh, you know, I am connected to many researchers uh, in AIML on LinkedIn. So regularly on LinkedIn, I will get in my feed images or videos like this, where researchers will showcase their work on object detection. And it all happens in real time. As these vehicles are moving on the road, these boxes also move along with the vehicles and the algorithm will also say, with the confidence that 88% it is confident this is a car, 91% it is confident this is a truck. And it also gives a figure, you know, is it coming in or going out, a particular truck, right? So, you know, all this uh, intelligence is now built into the algorithm. Now, why object detection and YOLO is so important? Because it has opened up so many areas of application today, we almost take it, uh, take them for granted. Surveillance may be a good thing, may be a bad thing, but surveillance is a big thing today. Face and this itself is based on other advancements in AI and ML. So face recognition, post detection, gate recognition, all this add to surveillance. Traffic management, so it can be used to ease congestion or reroute traffic from one uh, one road to an alternative route or automatic number plate recognition, ANPR. So that is another uh, area uh, of research. Then industry 4.0 or smart factories, where you can on the production line detect def def uh, defects in real time, or you can do action analysis. Like on the, pro uh, uh, on the production floor, many actions are happening, like picking and placing, rotating, moving the objects. So all those actions can be detected in real time using uh, uh, you know any object detection algorithm then sports analytics healthcare 
So in each of this, multiple applications are there. So I've just given a snapshot of what is happening in the industry. And what, in one way or another, all these applications rely on object detection. And because of this uh, importance in industry, in various industries, you know, YOLO uh, has had a significant impact. So if you look at the, uh, you know, overall evolution of object detection, notice there is a clear demarcation here. Before 2012, object detection was done using traditional detection methods. But after 2012, people started using neural networks because they now figured out how to use neural networks for real time images or real world images. So why 2012? Because of our first paper, AlexNet. So AlexNet changed the game, right? So after 2012, a uh, lot of image processing uh, applications started using deep neural networks, uh, convolution neural networks. And the uh, object detection algorithms are also uh, in the same category. And there are two threads. The one thread of application is what is known as a two stage detector. The other thread of uh, algorithms is one stage detector. And YOLO falls in the one stage detector category. OK, so now you may ask naturally, what is a one stage detector and what is a two stage detector? So a two stage detector, uh, what it has to do is. Uh, first, you have an entire scene. You don't know where the objects are falling in. So what it does is first it identifies the region. Where potential object is there, so that is called as a uh, region identification phase or region proposal. And after the region is identified, it goes through the second stage where you do a classification. Now, because the pipeline is broken into two stages, you know, you could optimize this, you could optimize this, but jointly they are not optimized. And if you have to optimize jointly, you need some sort of an iteration. You classify, then you go back, revise your region proposals, go back, reclassify. So you can imagine, uh, you know, to optimize end to end is more difficult. And overall, the two stage detector detectors are uh, are having a more complex architecture. They are more difficult to deploy and manage on the field. So that is where the beauty of YOLO came in. So it proposed a one stage detector where using convolutional neural network, it does both uh, detection of the object as well as classification in one pass. So that is why it is named as you look only uh, you only look once. So that is where the, you know because it's a one stage detector, the name uh, makes sense now. So in a single stage, it does both of these things. That means it does a bounding box and then it does classification. OK, so that that is what uh, YOLO has brought to the table. And because it's a single stage detector, you know the architecture is very simple. And because architecture is simple, you know, uh, even uh, common researchers uh, who don't have a lot of uh, knowledge of cloud platforms, who don't have DevOps experience, they could easily start using YOLO and deploy it uh, and st start training their networks. So this is again uh, like in AlexNet, this is the YOLO architecture. You can see there are a number of convolutional layers because now people understood Building deep networks with convolutional layers are great for images. And in this architecture, there are 24 convolutional layers and at the end, two fully connected layers. But and also note the second sentence. It is pre-trained on ImageNet. So we already talked about pre-training in the uh, first paper. So again, pre-training is becoming important, right? Because you don't have to now train your YOLO architecture from scratch. So many of the layers, the weights, biases are pre-trained with the ImageNet, and then you start training specifically for object detection, where you might not need such a big data set. OK, so this is uh, what the YOLO architecture is. So briefly, how the uh, how YOLO algorithm works, it takes the image, divides it into uniform grids of smaller cells. Then in each cell, it outputs this uh, vector. So the first uh, item in that vector tells whether there is an object in this. 
So you can look at the sky here. There are no objects. So it puts out a zero. But if there is an object in a particular cell, such as this green box, then it puts out a one. Then it does regression for the next four parameters. Right for continuous variables, we use regression rather than classification. So for the bounding box, it does a regression. And this regression, uh, this bounding box will tell you what in what are the coordinates of the uh, object. So it will give a center, width, and height. So those four parameters are captured in this bounding box. Now you will notice that you look at this red rectangle. You will notice that uh, there is no constraint that the bounding box has to be within the uh, grid cell. It can span or uh, overflow into uh, neighboring cells. So that gives uh, YOLO the expressive power. There is no constraint that it has to be within the grid. But the center of the bounding box should be within the grid. Right? And then around that, you do a regression to find out the height and the width. Then the class label. So in this example, we have assumed the three classes, maybe car, truck, and maybe two wheeler, right? So now you have identified this one and it's a truck. So you will put a one. So let's assume that C2 represents truck. So you put a one. So that means this object is classified as a truck. So this is how YOLO works. Of course, we are skimming over the details, but this is broadly uh, the approach. So what are the main contributions of the YOLO paper? Simpler architecture and deployment, real-time object detection. So the two-stage detectors, they were none of them were real-time because of the more complex architecture, more complex training time, longer training time. Uh, they were not able to do things in real-time, even in inference. Uh, but YOLO changed the game. And uh, in fact, uh, if you look at real-time detection, YOLO became the state of the art quickly. And it, because of the real-time nature of YOLO, it opened up a lot of new applications, and many of which I you know, uh, presented earlier in an earlier slide. And the thing about YOLO is it is all open source, so that's why the community likes it. And secondly, they have been releasing regular improvements, better loss function, better architecture, anchor boxes, right? That is to say, don't try to predict random sized uh, or random dimension uh, random shapes. Instead, you have a subset of anchor boxes, like subset of shapes, which are more, most commonly found. And using that as a reference, you start your prediction. So this leads to faster convergence. More diverse training data sets, higher resolution images, and so on. So these are the main contributions of the YOLO paper. Again, uh, continuing on our thread of uh, computer vision, the next important paper came out in 2014. And it was published uh, by Goodfellow and the team. And many of you might have heard this term, generative adversarial nets or GANs. And the abstract is given here. So let's see how this, uh, what is this GAN all about and how it changed the game for computer vision. Take a look at this. So GANs became popular because of images like this. Can anyone say that these are not real people? But in fact, they are all synthetic images. That means images created by neural networks. And the, all, the, all these images were created by something called style GAN published by NVIDIA in 2018. So they are so realistic, nobody uh, would guess that these are all uh, like generated by AI. But this is what happened in 2018. And how, how uh, you know, this uh, GAN improved results. So this was the state of the art before GAN came out, right? 2014 images generated by AI were something like this. Blurry, grainy, lacking details. And uh, yeah, kind of not that convincing. Then slow progression, progressive improvements. And then this is where you start to see GANs really coming into uh, like maturity. By 2017, 
they uh, they were being successfully applied to generate facial Im uh, images like this and then 2018 this is again you know the image re uh, released by nvidia interestingly there is also this url this person does not exist so briefly i will show you this so this is a image generated by the model it's not a image of a real person and if you refresh this page every second this website is generating new image or they may have cached it so you see every image here you can keep refreshing every image is generated by a neural network and you know it is impossible to tell whether it's a real person or generated by ai okay so very interesting and this is what kind of captured the imagination of everyone and uh, for uh, yeah of course you also have this problem of uh, fake uh, images being generated so what are some of the applications of gans so take an example i've just there are dozens of applications just to give you a flavor i have selected a few applications so here you have a real image of a woman with black hair using gan you can change her hairstyle to blonde or you can make her smile so here in the original image there is no smile here there is a broad smile then in the last example you can convert so from a woman you can convert to a male so these are transformations you can apply using gans take another example so today we are big on surveillance but sometimes when the subject of interest is far away the face of the subject will be at a lower resolution right you may and the camera may capture in real time a lower resolution image like this but for su surveillance purpose you may want to increase the resolution of this original image artificially so a gan network which is trained exactly for this purpose will able will be able to generate this image the one second right this is a high resolution image generated by the network from this low resolution image and you can see how good it is by comparing it the original high resolution image almost the same but if you zoom into the details you see the original is slightly better at the level of detail you know uh, this image still has little bit to go to match the original image but if you look at the big picture this does a very convincing job so this is another application of gan another application suppose you have a scene let's say this is a living room this is a dining area and this scene is uh, people have some algorithm let's say or it is manually done object segmentation has been done and labels have been attached to all the objects so for example this is a dining table this is a chair this is a chandelier this is a photo on the wall so all these labels have been attached so this labeled image is given to a gan so now what gan can do it simply takes this image converts it to a photo photo realistic image like this and you can configure the gan to tell uh, to uh, vary this like different colors of chairs different style modern classical etc so you can see this is one of the uses of gan you can give a kind of a, a label map and then it will give, give you an image other examples give a google map you can generate a satellite view give hand drawn sketches you can generate realistic images from those sketches last example of gan give a picture of few zebras the network will convert it to horses and vice versa take a photograph of a summer scene and gan will convert it to a winter scene or for that matter autumn scene take a realistic photograph uh, like photograph uh, as you can see here and then convert it to a artistic representation in various styles monet van gogh cezanne and yukio right again gan can be trained to do this so now to understand a little bit about gan we have to go into the details 
So first of all, what is GAN? The full form generative adversarial net. So we need to first understand what does generative mean. And uh, that will help us uh, understanding other algorithms that came later. So broadly in data science, there are two uh, types of models. One is a discriminative model and the other is a generative model. So take a classification problem like this. A discriminative model tries to identify the boundaries between the two classes. So assume these are males, these are females of a population. So discriminative model tries to identify the boundary. Whereas a generative model tries to identify or learn the probability distribution of the data. Right? And having understood the probability distribution, it can figure out, okay, this is a male specimen, this is a female specimen, and so on. So this is what uh, you know the approaches are uh, different in this manner. So discriminative models are used uh, in regressions, support vector machines, uh, hidden Markov model. Those are all discriminative models. Generative models are like naive Bay Bayesian models, uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, this GANs are also generative models. So this is uh, we will not go into further details, but uh, yeah, let's see during Q and A if you want to cover more, we can cover. So what is the GAN architecture? So the GAN architecture is like this. There are two models actually. So one is a discriminator, then the other is a generator model. Both are um, neural networks, okay? And uh, the simplest way to explain this is assume that this guy is trying to produce counterfeit notes. Okay, he takes some noise, produces counterfeit notes. This guy is like the cop or you can say the banking system. So the banking system is trying to identify which are real notes and which are counterfeits. Now, if the generator doesn't do a good job of generating counterfeit notes, the banking system can easily figure out that this is a real note, this is a counterfeit. So having done that, this will give out an output saying that, oh, this was too easy. The fake note doesn't look anywhere close to the real note. So this will say this is too easy. But this feedback will go back to the generator. Now generator gets some input. And it will improve the way it generates for the next iteration. So like this, it will do hundreds of iterations. And with each iteration, the generator will get better and better because of feedback coming from the discriminator. And at some point, the generator will become so good that it produces counterfeit notes, which look so much like the real notes. At that point, the discriminator is confused. It cannot make out which is a fake note and which is a real note. Okay. So now that is the point at which, you know, the network has been optimized. Like. Uh, now the generator cannot be improved further. So it has produced a note which is can be passed off as a real note. And this is the concept of GAN. Now I did not cover the technical details, but whatever we call feedback, that is all gradients. And those gradients are used for back, back propagation within the neural network. So those are the technical details I did not cover, but this is the overall idea of a generated discriminator network. Now, having done this, you can throw away the discriminator. Once the GAN, once the generator has become perfect, now you will use the generator to produce fake images uh, as you like. So whatever images or faces we saw earlier, that is all based on this. OK, it's based on the gen trained generator neural network. So what is the impact that GAN, the original paper of 2014, what is the impact it has had? You can see so many different variants. DC GAN, this is an important paper because this kind of improved and suggested a few changes to the original paper that people started, started adopting variations of DC GAN. DC stands for deep convolution. So you can again see why deep convolution is important. And this gave rights to cycle GAN, which we saw in the example of zebras and horses. Then other things, uh, style GAN, which we saw in the NVIDIA paper and so on. So, so many variations 
and here also on this thread so many different variations. OK, so what are the main con contributions? A uh, little bit technical here. Uh, previously, when people were trying to do this, they were using something called Markov chains. For sampling, but now with GANs that is no longer needed. Then the second important thing is no need to compute likelihoods. So typically you need to com compute maximum likelihood estimation you need to do. Which is generally a difficult thing for image processing. It's not such a big deal for NLP, but it is more difficult for image processing. Now you don't have to compute this because you are using. Uh, a generative model. Then it inspired many others opened up many novel applications. OK, so this is the third paper we covered. Let's move on to the fourth paper. Going back a little bit two years or two years ago earlier. So now we've come from the computing uh, computer vision domain to NLP, natural language processing. So in the domain of NLP, one of the important papers is this one. Efficient estimation of word representation in vector space. So to explain this briefly, uh, see computers cannot understand words or for that matter even images. Understanding when I say understand, I use it in the sense uh, the way humans understand images and text or words. So computers only recognize numbers. So words have to be represented as numbers and how to represent words efficiently and how to uh, and how that uh, rep representation can be efficiently processed by modern processes. That is the challenge. So one of the problems with uh, uh, words is the curse of dimensionality. So take for example uh, uh, this sentence: "The elephant sneezed at the side sight of potatoes." So this can be represented by a vector, and wherever you see that word occurring, you mark a one. So for example, elephant is present, so you mark a one. Off is present, you mark one, right? But she, the word she is not there in the sentence. So you mark it as a zero, right? So OK, so this kind of an encoding is called one hot encoding. For every word, you give one position in the uh, vector. But the, what is the problem here? Problem is that English language has roughly 200,000 words, right? And even if you reduce it to, you know, most commonly used words, you might end up with, uh, you know, 40,000 words, something like that. But, you know, to represent every sentence with, you know, a vector of size 40,000, it is going to be very hard for algorithms to process because eventually you are not dealing with sentences. You are dealing with paragraphs and uh, books which are having thousands of words. So what is the correct way? So this is the curse of dimensionality. You cannot be encoding like this. The second problem here is if you have a vector which is like uh, 200,000 dimension. And you are representing this entire sentence by that vector. Obviously, most of the positions will have zeros. Only few words which are present will have ones. So you run into another problem called uh, sparsity. So that immediately indicates that this is not a very efficient encoding uh, for words. But this is how people were encoding uh, words and sentences for a long time. And then there are variations of this. Instead of ones and zeros, they may encode it with frequency information. Or instead of frequency information, they might encode it with something called TF-IDF. So those are all variations, but none of these variations solve the problem of dimensionality. OK, so this was the kind of state of the art when this paper was published. But even before this paper, people had ideas like how to come up with an alternative representation. So that is what is given by this slide. Instead of using a long uh, a vector of very large dimension, why not use a small vector? So in this example, we are using only seven dimensions. But this entire sentence is represented in the seven dimensions. And you might ask how, how is it possible? It is possible because 
now we are not using any uh, we are not limited to integer values so we are allowing real valued numbers to be uh, encoded in this vector now this suddenly gives very high expressive power to your uh, representation so basically you have a real valued vector space with seven dimensions and in that seven seven dimensional space you are representing this point this sentence at a particular point in that seven dimensional space so now uh, you know there is no limit right uh, it is a real valued number so you can uh, uh, it, it is infinite you can have infinite number of points in that space so even if you have uh, thousands of sentences you can be sure some sentences which are alike they will be close together but you know you don't lose expressiveness by doing this but in practice, you know, a model such as word to vec which is what this paper released. It is not seven dimensions, but instead you have 100 dimensions, 300 dimensions, and in some cases even 1000 dimensions. So with so many dimensions, you get much more uh, expressive power. So you don't lose anything, in, uh, lose any precision or accuracy by doing uh, because seven dimension is kind of limited. But with 100, 300, and 1000 dimensions, your uh, representations are much better. The other things people found when uh, when this paper was published is that uh, sim is the semantic proximity. So you know, in reality, we are dealing with 100 dimensions and 300 dimensions. But uh, as humans, we can't visualize that. So those dimensions have been reduced to two dimensional space here just for our uh, visualization purpose. And you will notice something. All things which are kind of similar or appear in a similar context, they occur together in the vector space. So kitchen, sink, bathroom, toilet, faucet, bathtub, they are all occurring closely. But then this is far away from charger, battery, saw, Bosch, drill, tool, which are again because they are clustered here, you can kind of figure out semantically they have uh, more closeness compared to this group here. Right? Another example here LG, oven, refrigerator, microwave, GE. So again, you can figure out this is a class of dots which talk about uh, home appliances. This is uh, like kitchen or bathroom related. This is again electricity workshop related, that kind of thing. So semantic proximity. Another interesting thing is semantic relationships. This is also something that caught the imagination of NLP researchers. So take an example. Suppose I have three points in the vector space. I have Paris, France and Germany. Given these three points, I can run a vector arithmetic Paris minus France plus Germany. Then I will get a new point in the vector space, which will be close to what Berlin represents. Right? So Berlin, if it is not there in the vector space, you can compute it from these three points. And this is what we mean by semantic relations. Similarly, if king relates to queen, man relates to woman. If walking relates to walked, that is from present participle to past participle, Swimming relates to swam. So these kind of re semantic relations are encoded automatically in the vector space. So this is another interesting uh, insight that researchers found, uh, you know, as a result of this uh, word to vec paper. So again, I will not go into the details, but uh, you know, this is the architecture that was used in this uh, word to vec paper. Basically, uh, the way these embeddings so whatever you know 100 dimension 300 dimension representation of a word right every word has this representation so this representation is what we call as word embedding today the modern terminology is embedding so th to learn these word embeddings there are two tasks which were employed in the paper one task was the continuous bag of words the other one was keep gram so to explain it simply, in this task, you take some words before, some words after. And the task is to predict the word at the center. 
This one reverses the problem. Given a word at the center, can you predict the neighboring words which came before it and after it? So this is the, you know, uh, or these are the two tasks which were used to learn the embeddings. This architecture is itself is called LM architecture. Now you may guess what is LM? LM stands for language model. So today everyone is familiar because chat GPT is a language model. Not just language model, people have become used to using the term LLM, large language model, right? But language models have been around for decades, maybe 30, 40 years. But only recently that is, it is with this paper, that is the word to vec paper and some of the related papers before this, uh, going up to 2003, those papers, uh, brought back the interest in language models. And now language models have come a long way, but the real uh, interest uh, or the resurgence of language models started with this uh, word to vec paper, where people figured out how to use language models to train word embeddings, for example. And one of the beauty of this uh, word to vec or any kind of embedding is you don't need supervised training and the business of adding labels to training data set. None of that is required because the whole thing is self-supervised, right? There is enough data on the web for text data. Enough data sets are there. So there is no supervision needed. You already know which are the words before, which are the words after, which is the center word. This information is already there. So no extra labels are needed. So this is why, you know, why language models have become so important and why it was possible to train something like uh, word embeddings using these kind of architectures. So what are the main contributions of this paper? No need for nonlinear hidden layers. So I won't go into the technical details, but you know this, if you look at this neural network, it is very simple. There is an input layer, there is an output layer, in between there is a projection layer. Now how this input layer is mapped to the projection layer? That mapping is defined by a matrix. This matrix is what we learned. And this matrix is what represents the word embeddings that has been learned, right? So the weights of this model of this neural network architecture, that is not important to us. What is important is the representation that we learned, how to transfer from the input layer to the projection layer. And this simple architecture, it makes it very obvious. There are no uh, hidden layers like uh, non-linear hidden layers, which is actually very important for neural networks because none of the things that we learned in image processing, right? ImageNet, we used deep neural networks with many convolutional layers. That is, uh, that is actually a bottleneck for this kind of work. So they got rid of non-linear entity hidden layers and simplified the entire architecture. Because the neural network is not important to us. What is important is learning the embeddings. And because of this simplicity, they are suddenly able to work with high dimensional embeddings, work with large data sets. And uh, another reason why word to vec became popular because the C++ source code became uh, available and embeddings are also available. So you don't have to train your uh, train these embeddings yourself from a large data set. The work has been done for you. Just take these embeddings and start applying to your own NLP tasks. So this is like kind of the image net for NLP. And uh, this word to vec later inspired fast text at Facebook. So today fast text is very popular because it introduces certain innovations on top of word to vec and it can handle uh, text in many languages, not just English. And many NLP tasks can benefit from better word embeddings. Some of them I have given here sentiment analysis, machine translation, question answering, information retrieval. So all this today, we cannot think of any NLP task which doesn't use word embeddings. So that is why this has been a game changer in the domain of NLP. So the fifth and final paper, everyone probably have been waiting for this, right? This is the paper that finally results in chat GPT. 
there would not have been any chat gpt if not for this paper okay but that is not to say this paper if it had not been published chat gpt would never have happened surely some other paper may be little bit delayed somebody would have found this so what what is this attention is all you need so to answer this question first we need to understand what is attention right and from attention we will go to what is transformer and from transformer we will try to understand what is gpt so very simple actually attention if you look at this diagram not very difficult to understand so don't think that learning this is difficult attention is uh, easily explained by this diagram so before attention came people were working with what is known as sequence to sequence modeling so commonly used in uh, machine translation so here we are trying to translate from a english sentence to a chinese sentence are you very big and that is translated to its equivalent chinese characters so this is sequence right because uh, sentences are a sequence of tokens and tokens are nothing but words in a simplistic way so this is a sequence of tokens which has to be translated to a sequence of tokens in chinese so this is what a sequence to sequence uh, architecture looks like and this has been common for some time right sometime means before this paper came out in 2014 uh, yeah th this paper uh, proposed the attention based method i'll come to that but before this paper came out uh, the sequence to sequence modeling has been common now the problem with this uh, so there are two parts to this encoder and decoder but the problem is this entire information is encoded in a single context vector so when the decoder works you know what it will do it will take this context vector and it will look at the last three let's say in this case let's assume our window size is 3 it will take the last three outputs and the most recent context vector and then it will try to predict the next word right so that is how the decoder will work but the problem with this approach is the entire information here now you are trying to capture in a single context vector which is sometimes very hard to do it it can be okay for small sentences but what if your sentence becomes longer what if your sentence depends on previous sentences in the same paragraph or more complex case in a previous paragraph so then the sequence to sequence model doesn't do very well because people realize that capturing everything in a single context vector is very hard to do so that is why this paper from 2014 this is not the paper i have selected here this is a later paper from 2017 but we are getting there so in 2014 this paper proposed an alternative mechanism called attention based uh, mechanism or architecture where instead of passing a single context vector why can't you pass more information from the encoder to the decoder so that is to say you have already decoded three characters now you have to decode the fourth one but now you don't have a single you don't have just one context vector you have multiple things coming in so you can pretty much say you have in this case four vectors coming in and uh, all these lines represent interactions be between these units so you can say pretty much four vectors or maybe more than that depending on how it is modeled so you have much more information to do better prediction of the fourth word so this is where the whole concept of attention came so here attention is being passed from the encoder to the decoder okay so this is how uh, so this directly led to led to the improvement in performance of machine translation but from here we come to self attention so self attention is it is not attention between encoder and decoder it is attention between words in the same input so that is what self attention is so to understand this this example is again a beautiful example the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired now what is the meaning of this it what does it represent obviously it represents a noun but which noun does it represent street or does it represent animal if you look at this sentence in this sentence it is obvious that it represents animal 
so now we can say that there is a high amount of attention between these two words in this sentence that means attention is very strong whereas attention between it and street is weak and so on right but now let me change this sentence into just by changing the last word the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide same sentence all we have done is change the last word now suddenly everything changes now it is referring to street not animal so now what we say is the attention between it and street is very high and the attention between it and animal is weak so now a neural network which is based on attention architecture it has to learn these attention weights in this context it will say that the weight between these two words is very high in this context it will say that weight between these two words is very high and this is what self attention is all about okay so now uh, you know before we come to our paper right attention is all you need this paper led to other important papers another important paper is bert which is just as influential bert stands for bidirectional encoder representation from transformers so transformer is the architecture which is introduced by this paper and this paper inspired bert and from bert an entire class of algorithms came out so as you can see here bert xlm mt dnn mas span bert roberta then uh, i think uh, video bert then there is uh, alberta also it is not given here it must have come a little later yeah so all these papers were inspired by the bert algorithm which itself is inspired by transformers then the other thread from sequence to sequence is gpt right which is where chat gpt comes from so let's look at the history of chat gpt itself it came out in 2018 remember our paper attention is all you need came out in 2017 and within a year people figured out okay uh, gpt1 came out in 2018 at that time it had only 11 uh, 111 117 million parameters today gpt4 has 1.8 trillion parameters estimated because open ai never published any blog or anything giving the details but people estimate that it must be having 1.8 trillion parameters so the original one had uh, 1024 context context in the sense this is the context how far back how many words on how many words will you calculate the attention that is what is known as context so and then how many layers were employed in training the neural network so you can see the progression right so the big one is like from 117 million it has gone how many fold six fold 1.8 trillion six fold means i mean order of magnitude 10 to the power of 6 right so it is huge and uh, chat gpt 3 chat gpt uh, gpt 3 gave rise to chat gpt and this is what we have been using for a long time now this has been upgraded to gpt 4 in march of this year just a few months back so to give you an appreciation okay what is gpt what is the full form some of you might have asked generative pre trained transformer now we have all we have actually covered all of this now generative we already know what is generative we covered this in uh, in the previous paper where we talked about uh, gans so this is also a generative network pre trained this was introduced to us by imagenet the concept of pre training a neural network was introduced by imagenet transformer is introduced by this paper so what is the transformer architecture it is complex i will not go into it but this is what it is input embedding again you can see word to vec plays a role here right word to vec figured out how to calculate embeddings efficiently so that becomes an important uh, you know advancement for this paper itself and secondly positional encoding so one thing that word to vec doesn't care about is the position of the words it doesn't care whether the word comes before or after whether it is two words before or one word after before 
So position doesn't matter when you are learning word to vec embeddings. But in the transformer architecture, position is important because you are trying to figure out the overall context in which the words are occurring. So position is important. And then you have all these attention layers. Right, we have already covered what is attention. So you see in the encoder side, side of things, there is attention here, attention here. In the decoder side of things, attention here, attention here. And within the attention, you can zoom down further details how the attention head works. Right, we'll not go into the details here. So attention is passed from encoder to decoder, but it is you have attention within the encoder and decoder as well. So one thing you will notice here, something is missing, right? Why, why, why do people call it transformer architecture? What, what is so uh, unique? Or why, why to give it a new name, right? So the answer is here, because in all the previous cases, even if you take the sequence to sequence modeling, people were using something called RNNs, recurrent neural networks and uh, a variation of that called LSTM. And LSTM also then evolved to bidirectional LSTM. So those are sequential models, meaning that to process the next token, you should have processed the previous tokens. So you, you can predict only one token at a time, that is okay, decoder. But even encoder, when you are encoding, you can work only one token at a time. Because whatever processing you need to do for this token, it depends on the completed processing for the previous tokens. So it's a sequence to see. Uh, it's a uh, bidirectional LSTM. Uh, it, the architecture is sequential. But here in the transformer architecture, they have got ridden, uh, gotten rid of all those things. There is no RNN. There is no bidirectional LSTM. All that is gone. You only have a feed forward network. And most of the other work is done by attention layers. So suddenly this changes the game. Because now, because RNNs and other sequential models, they were sequential, they could not be parallelized on GPUs. But now transformers are no longer sequential. So now suddenly your training can be parallelized. And then this gave rise to inspired many other things like BERT and GPT, which can then be. So this is again like pre-trained. So you can have embeddings pre-trained on BERT or a model itself pre-trained on BERT. And then these can then be fine-tuned to specific tasks. So we already know what is the impact of BERT and GPT. And uh, as we have already seen, it has changed our way of life. The way we do Google searches and the kind of applications people are building today. The way we write resumes or apply for jobs or even reply to emails. Everything has changed because of chat GPT. So to summarize, this is what we have now in presenting them in chronological order. 2012 AlexNet, 2013 Word Embedding, 2014 GANs, 2015 YOLO, 2017 Transformers. And after that, everything that has come one way or another, like owe their uh, legacy to one of these. Then uh, to give some objective measure for this selection, you can look at the number of citations as given by Google Scholar for these papers. 120K, 37K, 59K, 38K for YOLO, Transformer 86K. And if you look at BERT, it is almost the same. It is also like 80K or something like that. So all are influential papers. Of course, we should have some special mentions because not everything has been covered. So there are some notable omissions. So these are some of them auto ML, XG boost, machine translation. Like here, whatever we I spoke about sequence to sequence modeling, those papers are also important because those resulted in tremendous improvement to speech recognition, machine translation, and so on. So those are also very important and they are all actively used in industry, right? So this is also an important thing. Variational auto encoder, deep face by Facebook, right? But I did not select this because this is not open source. It's proprietary. 
but this is a, a, a excellent algorithm which achieves close to 98% uh, accuracy then of course a whole class of algorithms which is exemplified by this one so i did not talk about reinforcement learning or pick any paper from reinforcement learning because reinforcement learning has a extensive history and uh, because of its long history it has had many incremental improvements so if you ask anyone identify one paper which dramatically improved the field uh, it is hard to do no, no single paper comes to mind because it has gone through a lot of incremental in improvements but reinforcement learning itself is a big field and alpha go and alpha zero and today we have alpha fold which is able which is used in the pharmaceutical and medical domain so those are all important advancement in the area of reinforcement learning of course self driving car that also comes under reinforcement learning the other big thing which is not given here is the recommender systems right so whenever you go to youtube or you know you are trying to install an app on google play or so many other things you do online you are always uh, people are always giving you recommendations install this buy this and so forth so that again you know has a long history there is no single paper which we can say has changed the game drastically so that is another reason why i didn't select that but that that also is a field in its own rank so that comes uh, that concludes my uh, presentation and these are the uh, links for you to learn more so already you know on devopedia we have published many of these things uh, in great detail like image net word to vec word embedding transformer neural network architecture bert language model so all this articles are already available on devopedia so if you wish to know more you can go and check out these uh, we are also requesting contributors to write the following articles which are currently not there but you can take a go at it if you are interested yolo and gan so i hope you found this session interesting now we come to q and a any questions go ahead kiran yeah kiran go ahead yeah you can unmute your mic and ask so we are not able to hear you you are speaking i can see is it i will uh, no i can't unmute he has to unmute kiran you have to unmute your mic okay we'll come back to kiran uh, anyone else has questions or any other feedback the rate at which the evolution happens uh many of what we discussed is almost obsolete that is a take what is your take on it no we can't say it's obsolete because uh, uh see transformer is a paper from 2018 in one way or another it is used today in chat gpt yes right but yeah. word to vec uh, and alexnet uh, those are yeah, academically see, uh, valuable uh, but yeah practice Ah, oh, very important because see the thing about AlexNet is it is changing the way of uh, it is giving a new path to solve a problem. So previously people never considered a convolutional network, deep and wide networks. That that is the uh, thing that AlexNet brought to the table, and it was to some extent it was aided by the availability of GPUs and large training data sets thanks to ImageNet. but uh, yeah by by uh, uh, proving that you know you can build a deep convolutional network and uh, each layer having many uh, neurons and then few other innovations like uh, overlapping max pooling layers and so by doing all these things it significantly advanced the state of the art so we will not use I'll go back and use alexnet but we will continue to use deep convolutional neural networks 
that is the thing that alex nin brought to the table yes yeah. academically that is that makes sense yeah, yeah. that is that, that is the reason why uh, you know that is important same yeah. thing with transformer nobody is going to go back and use transfer transformer uh, as per the original uh, paper true but uh, transformer has advanced the field thank uh, other uh, without that uh, it might have taken uh, maybe one year things might have happened a year later or two years later who knows yep thanks that was nicely done